Welcome to Hunt the Land podcast, centered on bow hunting, habitat management, and all things deer. Now here are your hosts, Mark Turner and Mariah Bogus. Hey guys, welcome to Hunt the Land podcast. I'm Mark. And I'm Mariah. This is episode 15, and today we're talking all about run and gun hunting setups. We're going to talk about their benefits, as well as the strategies behind them. But first, let's talk about Mark's opening day hunting plans. Hey, welcome to the show, everybody. We're happy you're here. Today, we are going to talk a little bit of deer hunting strategy. And I think uh, today's podcast is going to be probably really geared toward public land hunting, but none of these strategies are anything that you couldn't use on private land. And in fact, if you're hunting a large piece of private land or even a small piece, these could be deadly hunting tactics. I know um, I plan to use these over Thanksgiving break, hunting during the rut back home, and uh, definitely using them now down here on public land. And the strategies I'm talking about is the mobile hunting strategy of like running and gunning, maybe a climber or a hang on stand, being super mobile, just running where the sign is, hunting there, and uh, you know, just trying to stay on top of what's happening that's fresh out in the woods and trying to stay at least one step ahead of the deer or right there with them. So that's the plan for today. Uh, before, before we get started on that, need to catch up with Mark. Um, yeah, what's going on, Mark? You been been busy over there? Yeah, been uh, getting some work done, cutting some trees, working in, in the office a fair amount. Um, it was a kind of unfortunate weekend for me, though. Um, Auburn How's lost that? again. Oh, <laughs> this is two weeks in a row now, which I'm surprised. Actually, I'm impressed. And I didn't even bring it up on the last podcast about how Mississippi State beat us. But or I'm surprised you didn't. But uh, yeah, we lost to Tennessee yeah. yesterday. So that was pretty ugly. And then the Panthers lost today. And the good news is NC State did not play at all this weekend. So hopefully we beat Clemson next weekend. Go Pack. But there is a light at the end of the tunnel. And that is because it is deer season eve here in Alabama, and I could not be more excited about the fact that I get to go sit in a tree tomorrow. Hopefully, as long as everything is okay, I will be sitting in a tree tomorrow evening, and that's super boy, exciting. Oh boy. Yeah, well, you know, I didn't know what was happening. Well, I didn't watch the game first of all because I was in a tree. Um, I did, I did know that we won, so I acknowledge that. But I'm not one to rub it in because I really don't care that much i guess but yeah deer hunting that's super exciting do you uh you have a particular like spot picked out or are you just gonna kind of play it with the wind and see what the wind's doing down there or do you have a pretty good feel for what's gonna be right yeah so i've got i've got an idea um, i actually went in a couple days ago and checked some cameras that i'd hung um in some spots that I was looking at hunting pretty early in the season or maybe during the rut. I mean, they're good rut spots. I think they'd be good rut spots too. And I pulled both those cameras. They'd been soaking for like three weeks and all I had was doe and fawn pictures. So that was a little disappointing, but the good news is those are good rut spots. So I left one of them up and I think I'm just going to leave it up throughout the season and just kind of check it periodically just because it's, I mean, it's, it's in a good spot and, that's that one. I think I posted a picture on Facebook that's a good 10 foot, 10, 12 foot up the tree. I mean, it's way on up there. So it would be, yeah. and it, I mean, and it's locked on. So, I mean, it's hard to see anyway. So I don't, I don't think anybody's going to mess with it. So I figured I'd leave it up there, but yeah. So I think based on the wind, unfortunately the cold front has passed before I could legally get in a tree, which is a bummer. But I think based on the wind, I'm going to go to a spot that I've got a couple spots in mind. One of them's kind of near where I killed my buck last year, and it's off some beds that are in this little strip, this little um, creek corridor between a couple clear cuts. And there's this area where they burn the clear cut, and the fire got kind of hot in the woods in that little creek corridor, and it 
killed some trees and there's it's just grown up with blackberry and stuff that's about five six foot tall but there's a few little patches out in there that are a little more um more grassy versus being full of brambles and in those spots there were some pretty good sized beds and some rubs so that's one possibility i was thinking about just hunting off of those the other one that i'm kind of leaning more towards is i think i told you about one day I was out scouting and we we're I was with a buddy and we were walking along and this area has some persimmons in it too, which kinda ups ups the odds in, in my mind. But it uh we were walking along and I saw this little spot on Onyx that was just a bare spot along this creek and I was like, I wanna check that out. You know, it just didn't have any trees on it. And it turns out it was just a couple trees had blown down there and there's a big uh thicket of uh grapevines on the ground and I turned to my buddy and I was like, Hey, this looks like, like I'm surprised there's, we're not bumping a deer out of here. And about like literally two seconds later, this buck got up and ran off and I, I never did see it, but well, I never did see the antlers, but it, it was definitely a buck. I mean, it was bigger and there were a bunch of rubs around there and just looking at, I mean, they were pretty good sized tracks, which I know is not none of those, you know, just by itself means it was a buck, but everything taken together i feel like it was so it's kind of one of those spots i'm not i want to try hunting off beds a little bit like i, I want to try and learn more about that and you know see if i can at least see some deer doing that but i'm not i'm not like 100 percent like committing to that being my strategy just because i didn't necessarily do the best job just scouting just for beds like oh there's you know, beds here, beds there. I mean, I definitely pay attention to it, but that's one spot that based on the wind tomorrow, I think I could get in there and based on the way everything's laid out, I could probably get within 150, maybe probably about a hundred yards or so of where that bed was. And it's also just a decent area. Um, just because like I say, it's got some persimmons in there and there's probably, there's some water oaks down there that are probably dropping. And it seems like most of the white oaks, are just not don't have many acorns this year at least in on that wma so i'm looking forward to it i, I think it'll be a good hunt we'll see what happens uh kind of gonna swing for the fences a little bit i guess hunting a bed versus just hunting a dropping persimmon but i can't shoot a doe until like i think like two more weeks yeah so I, i'm kind of content i'm kind of okay going in and just saying well if I see a deer, maybe it's one I can shoot. If I don't see any deer, then whatever. I hear you. Well, I I wish I had some exciting news since our last podcast, but unfortunately, I have not stepped foot in the deer woods since then. I have been helping collect uh, tree data, um, tree measurements. I planted 200 seedlings at my study site for future research project up there and i spent today picking up acorns and uh, spent all weekend basically processing trail camera photos which sounds like a lot of fun until you have to do it for research where i basically went through i don't know 12 maybe fifteen thousand photos in the last day and a half and a lot of those, of course, were blank, but of that, I think I um, logged 900-some photos, and most of those photos were the old eastern gray squirrel. <laughs> the other ones were some mice, lots of raccoons, some armadillos, and uh, a couple deer here, and a couple turkeys here and there. So, yeah, so tra trail camera photos are, are, are not as much fun when you're when you have to log all that information for each photo, it takes forever. But because oh, of that, sure. I haven't been in the woods. Yeah, that's kind of been staying between me and the woods. So even though it was our fall break, um, at least here at Mississippi State, we're coming off fall break, so there's four days straight off. I have not yet to have a day off. But anyway, that's what you do uh, when you work with what you love and especially when you're a graduate student <laughs> that's what you do so yep no hunting here i feel that <laughs> i i kind of feel like hey let me know mark but i think we should do a podcast in the future where we talk about what it means to be a graduate student and if there's anyone out there that would like to hear that maybe everyone probably doesn't even care 
they probably don't care at all. But I feel like until you're in graduate school, you have no idea what really graduate school is and what it all means. So if anyone is in, interested in that, let us know because that is our lives right now. And that's why we basically work 24 seven and then maybe hunt here and there. So enough with my rambling there. Um, so I don't <laughs> have anything. I mean, fun it could to... definitely be worse, but I mean, well, I mean, oh, we yeah. could be we could be sitting. I say we could be sitting inside all day, but some of the time that's what, yeah, that's it what I do. Being. But <laughs> regardless, wouldn't trade it for the world. No, obviously not. I mean, I yeah, this is definitely uh, where I want to be and where I'm supposed to be. Um, but definitely, uh, next couple of years are going to be very busy and fun. For sure. Very fun, but very busy. And lots of times I feel like I'm running around with a chicken, like a chicken with my head cut off. So this is my um, disclaimer for anyone out there. If there's ever a blog that's late on the on the website or um, podcast that's late, or maybe we just don't post anything for a while, it's probably because we're both working, you know, 20 hours a day or something crazy and driving all over the place. Um, but anyway back onto the hunting subject um i do plan to go on tuesday afternoon which again i guess that's something not everyone can do so that's a perk of being a grad student is that i've worked all weekend so maybe i'll be able to take an afternoon off and i'm kind of thinking the same thing as you mark there's actually some bedding i talked about last week where i jumped some bucks and i'm kind of i don't know i had been talking about waiting a month or two to go in there but now i'm kind of thinking about striking while the iron's hot we're gonna have a complete 180 on the wind but I think that actually makes that little island set up better for those deer. And I'm kind of playing with the idea. I may do that. And like you said, it was kind of an all or nothing setup. If I set up there, I'm not going to shoot it though. If I end up shooting something, it's going to be something big. So, well, and that's, we'll see. You, that's one of the perks, I guess, too. And this is something I had not thought of until just now. But, you know, most places, and even North Carolina, but especially... Uh, you know, a lot of the areas of the Midwest where their season doesn't open till October 1st, you know, is opening around the same time that ours is, you know, let's say your season opens the same time that it does in Mississippi, but you're in, you know, Iowa or I think Illinois opens October 1st. Like a lot of those Midwestern states open same time that Mississippi does and close to the same time Alabama does. Well, there, if you go into your best spot and bump some deer out, you know, you're you're only a month or so away from the rut, which I think is why a lot of people are more hesitant to do that down here, yeah. depending on the part of the state you're in. But you know, uh, the places that I'm hunting primarily. And I think if I remember correctly, the places that you're hunting too, you know, the rut's not going to happen until January. So, I mean, if you bump a deer any time in October, he's got a month and a half minimum, probably, you know, really more like two months to kind of get over it so you you i feel like you've got a little bit more time to let deer you know get over like you know if you go busting into a spot and mess it up it might not be as big of a deal as if you were hunting an area where well the ruts the ruts just a couple weeks away and i just went in and boogered up my best area that's that's yeah that's very true and and i'm also kind of you know I'm approaching a season probably a little differently than I will in the future. I'm so green on these properties and yeah, I've walked them, but, um, you know, we're going to talk about this here in a second, but mobile hunting, you know, this particular property I'm talking about, I took one day and I, uh, you know, a week, week and a half ago in season and I ended up just walking through it basically with the wind blowing in my face, trying to find a spot to set up and never, you know, saw what triggered my eye as a perfect spot until I basically stepped on these bucks and, they uh you know ran out of there so i've gained a lot you know of knowledge just by bumping deer and yeah it's not that great but you know i'm gonna be here a couple years and i'll definitely tuck that away and like you're saying later in the year there's nothing to say that uh, one of those deer won't be betting there i mean heck I, I bust them out when they're in a bachelor group so you know one of them will probably you know later in the year it'll probably only be one deer in there or who knows a whole different deer is gonna bet in there you know when it gets when when home ranges move around when deer kind of disperse a little bit more than they are now so it's very true and i'm i'm just going into this just kind of all the way and 
if I bust a deer, I bust a deer, but at least, you know, I learned something from it and that's better than sitting back and not seeing anything at all because that's not going to help me in the future and it sure isn't going to help me now. So even if I don't kill a deer now under e either one of those tactics, I guess I'm just trying to look at it like maybe someday down the road it will, you know, help me. And I think so far, like, you know, I, I bumped those deer the other day and yeah, I was kind of wrecked that night, but... Um, at least knowing what I don't know now, I feel pretty confident going back in there. And, uh, you know, I guess time will tell. But, uh, yeah, that's that's kind of my thoughts on that. Um, you want to transition to our subject? I guess we're kind of already talking about it. <laughs> yeah, we can jump right in. And I guess this is, a, you know, we're going to be talking about run and gun style hunting. And this is an appropriate topic because obviously this is something that we're doing but one thing that i'm really excited about mariah that i i finally bit the bullet and we're not we're not going to talk gear too much here but I, I finally bit the bullet i guess three days ago and it came in the mail yesterday and i ordered and got a lone wolf assault did you really man you are on like a streak because it our last podcast, you told me that you bought a climber, which I know. Kudos well, this there. One... <laughs> like, I think you'll like that. But this one was a little more, a little spontaneous, but at the same time, like I, I had justification. So I had a bunch of Bass Pro gift cards. So I don't know if I remember I told you this, but I had this issue with <laughs> these those rubber boots, and I ended up taking them back, and I ended up getting these other ones that were on sale, and they gave me a bunch of money in gift cards, and I had a couple. I think like two birthdays worth of Bass Pro gift cards, which I don't know about you, but I have several people that that's what they typically get me is Bass Pro or Cabela's gift card. Which and by for the way, that, if anyone wants to buy either one of us anything, that's perfect. <laughs> yeah, which for everything that I hate about this stupid Cabela's Bass Pro merger because it's terrible, just awful. At the same time, I will say that there is a benefit because now I have gift cards that I can use it either place because i had some i ordered it from cabela's but i used a bunch of bass pro gift cards and i had a couple cabela's too so i basically wait. paid wait wait time out uh -huh. okay i i tried to look this up the other day online and this will be helpful to everyone else out there so you can use yeah you just i have two i have two bass pro and one cabela's so you can you can use them both together yep so you you have to call and i think what they'll do is they'll either They'll do something with your gift card if you wanted to use it in store. I don't know if you could just go in store and use one, but I, I had to call. You know, they have a number online that you call, and it just takes you to customer service. Like, I thought it was going to be some play, some fancy thing, but no, it just took me to customer service desk. And so I started talking to him, and he's like, yeah, if you'll just go ahead and place your order if you want to, like, we can just do it over the phone. And I was like, that's fine with me. So, yeah, you can use you can use your gift card at either place. So I more or less paid for the stand with, those gift cards so that was that that's why I, I did that but i know i've been on this gear streak and i don't typically buy a lot of new gear so it's been very weird for me yeah well but i don't hey i don't know what to think <laughs> it's all right because today i went and bought a deep freezer a chest freezer which oh, nice. i needed and yeah. i'm and that's this is the question why i asked about the gift cards is i need to buy a cooler and i've kind of been looking at the cabela's cooler so oh nice yeah yeah, you can you can actually buy those. That was the weirdest thing for me. When I walked into Bass Pro Shop and saw those Cabela's, what are they, like the Polar Cap or whatever coolers? Yeah, uh, the Roto Molded called, but... Cooler. Yeah. Yeah. That was weird for me seeing that. But Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm considering buying one, but I can't figure out if it's worth the money to buy one. I, what I really like about their design is that they have that pressure release valve on the front. And, I mean, you, you know how it is when, like, you open your buddy's Yeti or Orca or whatever, and it seals, and it's so hard to get the lid undone. It's just really frustrating. So I'm, I, that's why I'm looking at Cabela's at least. Yeah. Um, I'm content with my Igloo $50 five-day cooler. But, you know. D wait, wait, wait. Hold on. Is that so the five day one? <laughs> now we're really off topic, but I've been <laughs> watching cooler reviews when I have a minute or two. And uh, <laughs> with your busy grad student life, <laughs> no, honestly, it's like when I need to go to the bathroom and I <laughs> you sit up, sit there till your legs fall asleep. Um, <laughs> how's the uh, how's the ice life on the five day cooler, the Coleman five day? Because I actually looked at buying that because 
I'm kind of of a mind of just spend like 50 bucks now because I'm only going to use it when I have a deer. It's not like I go and party and go to tailgates and stuff and yeah. for that. Yeah, because everybody parties for like, you know, a week straight and needs ice for that long. But uh no. Or or backcountry. You yeah. know, that would be yeah, I that, guess one. That's the one that's the one thing where it might be more better to have one of those better quality ones. Or if you're gonna be tough on your gear. But um I have that I can't remember if it's the igloo or the Coleman. I can't remember which one it is, but it, it's whichever one is sold at Walmart and it's fifty bucks and it's white. I wanna say it's igloo. It's the igloo five day and it may not be five day it says like keeps ice for five days or something but i believe it's the igloo version but it does i mean it keeps ice if you fill it all the way up and you know keep it in the shade and it's not i mean if it's the middle of summer it's one thing but you know this time of year definitely keeps ice for five days yeah so it's not it's it is way it keeps ice way better than your like super super cheap you know your cheap coleman or igloo that's gonna melt within you know a day or two uh so i I like it i mean i used it last year to keep deer in and i'd keep them in there for a couple days before i got to processing them so i like them yeah well there yeah everybody listening got more than they bargained for but yep i'm I'm in the cooler mindset because i'm trying to figure out the most efficient way you know i just want to have something in the back of the car and when i get a deer throw it in there and sometimes i you know like we're talking about we're busy so I shot my deer on Sunday and I didn't get a chance to butcher until last night. You know, I cut steaks and trimmings mm-hmm. and by the way, made a big, uh, uh, neck roast and then pulled the meat and made barbacoa and, uh, oh, nice. anyway, you know, tasty stuff, but I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to better streamline that process now that I'm, you know, kind of uh, oftentimes more out in the woods and not near home where I can just hang her up or yeah. hang whatever it is up yeah i got you yeah those those are good coolers especially just for throwing deer in to keep for a few days i I like mine but okay well all right well i was trying you were trying to transition (laughs) yeah all right so you got the the real back in yes let's let's talk we're we're we're, it's like reeling in that tuna like lines way out there but uh why why the salt and what do you got on the salt so the reason I went with the assault was they um obviously it's a light stand and that was the one thing you know it's about as light as the stand I had with before which was a hawk helium but there's a couple things that I like about the assault it has the cast platform which is going to be quieter and then the other thing that I like about it and this is probably like kind of contrary to like what I would have initially thought but one of the biggest issues I had with the helium was I found it was kind of unwieldy trying to hang in the tree just because it does have such a big platform. And I think I'm going to like the smaller platform for just throwing it up in the tree. And I I don't know. I think I'm going to like it better. And obviously it's kind of nice. I mean, I'm, I'm not like a big name brand, like has to have the, I don't, my stuff doesn't have to match. Like you've seen my camo. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) But at the same time, it is kind of nice that, this gear because i already had the lone wolf sticks you know it's made together like it has the spot in the seat for it that you can um so it's made to pack with the sticks that i already have and it's just one of those things i don't think i'm going to regret buying because it's it's just one of those pieces of gear that if you get the right thing it'll last forever so i don't think i'm pretty i'm pretty you know i'm glad i was uh I was going to say, you know, I, I got my lone wolf climber this year and I think it's the exact same base. Like it's, it's the exact same molded base. It's just uh-huh. made into a climber and that bow hanger or the bow holder is an awesome thing. You'll really love that. You like that? I, I was debating about whether I would like it or not, whether I should add a bow holder to the side or not. Well, does you it know, get, it's kind of like getting the way of your feet. That's the only thing I was like kind of a little concerned with. Well, kind of like back to what you're saying. I, I like that stand. Well, first of all, a bigger platform means you have to haul it through the woods, which means you're snapping more branches, making more noise, and getting more annoyed the whole time. So I do like the small platform, like you're saying, and uh, or smaller platforms because both my stands, my hang on and my climber, are smaller. But yeah, that the bow. So the, with the bow holder, what I did is um, I went all around the outside of the bow holder with paracord so that my bow 
for one doesn't get all scratched up and for you know second point is um quiet yeah um which i already did and, that today <laughs> okay yeah so i and i wasn't sure how i would like the holder as well but you know most of the time it, it really just doesn't annoy me it, it's one thing i think about but even with uh the bow holder on my hang on off the side like i think about that even more because i don't know about you but when i sit there my leg you know my knees kind of hang out to the sides and it's it worries me because i'm worried that my knee's gonna bump that the side of my bow and push it out of the bow holder um on my hang on and at least with the lone wolf my knees you know have, i mean when you sit down your your knees have a tendency to go out not in together um i mean i, I guess like yeah i mean that's it, you, you just comfortably sit down and your knees don't like hit together so really all it comes to is your feet just being a little bit more mindful of your feet but yeah you know it hasn't been an issue for me yeah i really i really like it um it's one less thing hanging off the side of my stand because the bow bow holder grabs vines and branches and stuff and yeah i think uh if i if if i had my for my hang on if i could have it or not i would definitely take it and i would get rid of the bow holder okay well then that makes me feel good because i was I, I was a little concerned about how i was gonna like that but yeah that was one of the things i did today after i got out of church and i was like ooh, i need to um <laughs> i got out and i was like i was like i need to i was going to the store anyway to get some food and i was like i need to get some paracord to quiet that stand up because just like with any lock on if you don't put something between the seat and the platform it's gonna clank so yep. that solved that problem. And exactly I, I right. really like the design. It's just it's just a well built product and I mean there's definitely a reason that people use them and I'm excited to put it up in the tree. But we have gotten a long ways into this podcast without talking about strategy. So <laughs> do you wanna do you wanna dive into that a little more? Um talking about your yeah. kind of the, the mindset and the benefits to a run and gun strategy. Yeah, I mean, I think it can be summed up in one word, and that's mobility, I guess. Um, it's just another way to describe, you know, kind of run and gun, but it's so important because deer are constantly changing. You know, right now, they've been on persimmons, at least the areas with persimmons have been hitting persimmons pretty hard, but as a lot of these persimmon trees are starting to dry up, they're going to be transitioning to hard mast even more than they have been in the past, and that can change on almost a day-to-day basis which tree they're hitting. And, uh, yeah, I mean, if you're not in them, you can't shoot them, right? So I think being able to move is is paramount, especially, you know, on public land where you have moved, uh, room to move. It's super important. Um, you know, that's one thing I hate about the private land that I have. It's a small, and I feel like I'm stuck in one spot, and I end up sitting in the same stand. And you're just hoping, you know, what is the definition of insanity? It's like doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different outcome. I think that's pretty, pretty darn close yep. to that. Yeah, it is definition. Yeah. So like, I mean, if, if you're sitting in the same stand, unless you have a really good reason to think things are going to change, uh, you're insane not to move to where the deer are <laughs> basically is what that says. Um, so I, th- I, you know, I love being able to be mobile and, you know, last weekend was a great, uh, example of that. I, just put a stand on my back and walked until I found good deer sign set up and shot my doe, shot a coyote, and could have shot another doe. So I think the proof's in the pudding there. What do you think? I, I agree 100%. And I, I think one thing that's one little key that you, you brought out there a little bit is that, you know, while obviously we're getting into this because we hunt public land and because we're being forced to hunt public land more, which which is a good thing and I think I think both of our hunting strategies I know mine has my I feel like my hunting has improved quite a bit and I've learned way more and I think way more about things than I did this time last year and and I think you're going to be the same way a year from now just just having to hunt public and having to be mobile and so yeah it's it's definitely taught me a lot and but with that being said even if you are not being forced to be mobile even if you hunt private land I mean, unless you're just hunting a little one acre chunk, I would definitely, definitely encourage you to still, you know, invest in a good setup so that you can be mobile because the the ability to move around and change stands, it really makes a big difference. 
and I think one of the things that's kind of nice with public land and that you, you have to be aware of with private land is even if you have other stands, you know, you may be more tempted to, well, I could move a setup like 60 yards closer to this spot because I think it'll be better for the wind or whatever. But, you know, I, I think I should just hunt the stand that's sitting, you know, set up already. Well, with the ability to be mobile, you can choose the perfect tree every single time that you go out and you're not sitting there like, well, you know, I have this other setup. I don't really want to go through the work. And I think that's one of the biggest benefits of having to hunt mobile hunting public land is that it'll force you to do that. But I think if more hunters were willing to just realize like, yeah, it's going to be more work, but it, it definitely has improved my hunting. And I feel like I've had a lot more success even on some of the sits that I've had on private land, because I mean, last year the buck I killed on private was out of a stand that I hung a day before. And I could have easily set a stand that was about 150 yards from that. But instead I put a stand in the right spot and ended up killing a deer. So I just, I think that that, that really, it's just so, so important to have the ability to be mobile and have the willingness to be mobile. Yeah. I, you know, and what you said there really strikes a chord because I hear a lot of guys, you know, I I actually saw on Facebook the other day, this guy that always posts the same photo from the same stand from the last couple of years over a corn pile. And he never seems to kill anything. Well, last night he killed a really nice buck and, and I'm happy for him. Like, that's awesome. But it's almost, you know, I kind of feel bad for him because you just, you're just missing out on so much by sitting in the same spot. Like that just gets so, I don't know about you, but I get bored, you know, sit in the same spot. I'd like to have a, a, a change of view. And that's not the only reason I move, but, uh, you know, that's just another benefit of it. And I think once you can kind of come to terms with knowing that there's going to be a little work on the front end and the back end of every hunt, you know, climbing down and carrying out and all that, it's really not that bad, you know? And I don't know about you, but like, now going, you know, going home and hunting in a permanent stand is going to feel almost like cheating. Like it's just going to be so easy, just you know, walk up the stand and sit down. But I, you know, I kind of enjoy the the hanging and getting up there, and it's it's a complete different view. And you know, just kind of anticipating. You know, you know, once you sit down, I don't know what it is, but it just feels like such a fresh start. And you're just like any absolutely anything could happen here. And I really like that feeling. Exactly, I hundred percent agree, and. And I guess that kind of goes to to something else that we should discuss, and that's the fact that if you have a mobile hunting strategy, and you have the even if even if you mainly hunt out of fixed stands, or you hunt the same spot sometimes with your either climbing or you know standing sticks, even if you hunt those locations a lot, just having the ability to be mobile gives you the opportunity to say, hey, you know, I was sitting up in the stand earlier, and I was looking at on on my phone at either you know, Google maps or Onyx or whatever. And I noticed this thing, I want to go check it out. And instead of just walking in to check it out and then maybe having to come back and bring a stand or whatever, you can just leave, leave an hour early for your evening hunt and say, okay, I'm just going to scout my way in. And once I get to this particular point, I'm going to put a stand up if it looks good. And if it doesn't, then I've got this other area I want to go check out or You know, go back to a location that I know is going to be good. And I think that's, that's a, that's a big key to success is just being willing to recognize that, Hey, if you, if you find a spot while you're sitting in the stand on maps or just when you're sitting in the office or wherever you are, if you find a spot, just go check it out. There's no harm in walking in with a stand on your back. Maybe you bump some deer, but maybe you don't and you put a stand up and kill a good one. And I think agreed. The the Agreed. only thing with that, and I kind of want to get your take on this, is I don't I always like it. have no, trouble. Mark, you're wrong. You're no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I always have trouble. The one thing I always have trouble with is deciding when I should stop. Like if I'm getting oh, into a yeah. spot and I start seeing good sign, when should I stop and when should I keep going? And I I want to get your your personal take on it, and then I'll I'll share mine. Yeah, no, I struggle as well. And it gets to the point where every single step I cringe and, you know, and then a lot of times it's a self-fulfilling prophecy and I end up jumping deer right there. Uh, Last 
the last hunt I went on, I talked about where I had some does come past me. I ended up passing one and saw that two-year-old six point. I actually was feeling that same way, and that's why I didn't go. I actually walked to this tree, almost set up there, and if I did, you know, that's where all the deer would have walked, but then I couldn't set up there because there was poison ivy all over it <laughs> and uh, and backed up. But that whole time, I felt like another step, and there was going to be a deer that blew up under me. And uh, I don't know. I don't even know why I told that story, but <laughs> they didn't, I guess. That's what I'm trying to say. They don't always, uh, if you're smart about it. And I was also like, that was a windy day. So I would move when it was more, you know, when there was some wind covering my sound and hopefully a little bit of my movement as well, which is something, you know, definitely keep in mind. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't know. I just, I've always struggled. And I guess my personal take is I try to trust my gut, but at the same time, you know, if I'm, if I, it kind of depends. I feel like if I'm in thicker cover, I'm much more likely to stop short and just, just hang where I am because I'm like, okay, there could be deer bedded like right here. But if I'm in more open terrain and I can see a little ways further and don't feel like d deer are as likely to be able to hide there and just be bedded up. Cause you know, if a deer's walking through, I feel like your odds are decent of not spooking it as long as you're fairly quiet and taking your time. But the deer that you're going to spook are the ones that are just laying there and just waiting for something to come, come get them. <laughs> yeah. And well, it, actually here's another thing. Um, and I bet you I didn't even mention this uh, on our last podcast, but that doe that I killed um, on the persimmons, I keep going back to that because that's my success story here. But <laughs> right as I was, you know, I had walked up on that spot and realized that I had already walked too far. Like I had put, I was putting down ground scent there. So I kind of backed off just a little bit, got on the downwind side. As I was actually walking up to that tree that I ended up hanging the stand in, I jumped a deer not 40 or 50 yards away that had been watching me the whole time. You know, and that was frustrating. And who knows? I mean, that could have been, you know, a, a really nice buck. And I'll never know. But um, I guess it just kind of goes to show that just because you jumped a deer there, there's also a lot to be said for, okay, don't go any further now. And, you know, just understand there's other deer in the woods. Um, another story I can think of was last year I went in on a new piece of property as soon as I was stepped foot in the woods, like literally two steps into the leaves, jumped a bunch of deer right there at the top of the hill, and I was headed down the hill. And I ended up going to the bottom of that hill and set up there and killed a doe as they were all heading back up to the bedding area to investigate what had just happened because they weren't really sure what had happened. So, you know, I guess that's kind of what people call a, a bump and dump situation. But, you know, I think it's worth mentioning when you are out there running and gunning and you bump a deer, all is not necessarily lost. Sometimes that same deer will come right back in because they're such curious animals. I mean, they, they just, they have to know what's going on. And, uh, and then also, I mean, there's a ton of other deer in the woods. So I, you know, I guess that's one thing that I would, I would try to voice to other people thinking of being more mobile is don't lose all hope just because you jump a deer learn from it the best you can and then if it still looks like a really good spot with a lot of sign i think you're still good to set up there and obviously it's gonna be different every time but i think for the most part you still stand a really good chance yeah i definitely agree and i, I guess one of the things that we could do here uh, just to kind of highlight some of the benefits to having this mobile hunting strategy is talk a little bit about kind of our strategy through the season and how it's going to change because I think there's there's definitely some there's definitely opportunities throughout the season where a mobile hunting strategy is going to benefit you even even if your base strategy is like okay well I'm just going to go sit this area that I always do or whatever um and I guess you know I'll kind of start that up the first one's early season and I think this is the most obvious which is why I'm going to take it because it's the easiest one <laughs> and uh that's hunting over mast you know, if you're, if it's early season and you have the ability to just walk through the woods, you know, okay, I know there's a bunch of acorns on the ground through here or persimmons or whatever. I'm just going to walk through the woods, find the fresh sign, set up a tree stand. And that, that's super yeah. important because while there are obviously some trends in individual trees producing a lot of mast in some years versus others, 
there's a lot of opportunity if you just sit one stand to be missing out on differences in production like this tree may produce more one year this other tree that's 50 yards down the ridge is going to produce more the next year and so you have some opportunities to kind of hit those highs in production whenever you have that mobile hunting strategy and so i guess yeah you know do you want to what are your thoughts on like the rut as far as, or do you have any more early season thoughts? I guess I should. <laughs> no, I agree with you a hundred percent. I wouldn't really add anything else there. Uh, on the rut. I know for me, you know, a lot of my rut hunting experience has been on, like I said, private land where you're kind of stuck in one spot, but I have saved my mo. you know, any move I'm going to do into a really, you know, good spot, a bedding area or a spot where I know I'm going to, bump deer but stand a good chance i've saved for the rut and so i guess kind of by virtue they've been really good hunts but on the you know during the rut on my private land i'm gonna jump right into the pretty much the thick of the bedding the downwind side but pretty much the thick of the bedding and those are kind of historical spots that uh i know to be good because i've observed deer you know going to and from there in the past here, you know, on public land, I'm, I, 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 you know, mentioned that I'm, you know, I'm, I'm spending a lot of time walking, and if I bump deer, I bump deer. Um, I'm also, this will be my first year hunting these properties, so I'm kind of learning what hunting pressure is going to look like, you know, whenever I start to see it in gun season. So that's really going to change things, and I think that's going to really influence what I do for the rut, because here in Starkville, the rut is basically between Christmas and New Year's. And uh, I'm not going to be here. I'm going to be home hunting post-rut deer. Um, But after that, in January, I hope to hunt, you know, post-rut deer here, or I may hunt pre-rut a little bit in December here. In those instances, I'm probably going to approach it a lot like I am now, except I'm not really going to focus nearly as much on food. I'm guessing that by then the deer will be probably hitting water oaks pretty hard and maybe some willow oaks you know the red oak group and so i'll I'll know where those areas are but i don't know about you uh in your situation but here the red oaks are dropping very well all the water oaks are dropping very well so i'm not gonna be able to pinpoint a tree um probably as easily as i can right now like a hot tree but i know the areas that are full of acorns and so i'll know some general you know general travel routes but i you know come close to the rut down here i'm gonna i'm gonna be focusing a lot on where there's heavy cover and bedding you know i'm I'm probably gonna more and more move into bedding areas and uh risk messing things up but uh i i really think that's what you have to do especially when there's a gun season open um but yeah like i guess in general my rut hunting strategy being mobile would be Jump into those bedding areas. You're probably only going to get one solid hunt out of it. Get in there early morning, and if everything seems good, hunt it all day if you can stand it. A hundred percent agree. And and one of the things that kind of comes with that is during the rut. Obviously, there's a lot of areas during the rut that are going to be more historical funnels and stuff like that. But at the same time, whenever you're hunting a new property, and one hunt in particular comes to mind with this. There are just spots that you miss, and this isn't necessarily a a mobile strategy deal so much as a, hey, like, you know, moving a permanent set. I should probably move this permanent set deal, but do you remember, I guess it was like three years ago, whenever we were sitting in a tree, and you were filming me, and we were, we had that decoy out, and we had Robert, the five and a half year old four point chase a doe like 150 yards down the field edge yep i remember it very well and he came out of this corner of the field and we started talking and we we're like why why is this stand why did we put the stand here why are we not sitting down at the corner of the field we ended up moving a stand there and not that year but the next year we ended up killing a deer and it's just one of those deals yeah. that we probably should have just moved the stand immediately and not waited, which I think we moved it a couple of days later. I don't think we waited super long to do that, but had we just been in a mobile setup, 
we might have hunted that stand once, seen deer movement elsewhere, and moved a stand. I, I just, I really, I really like hunting mobile, and I'm trying to, I'm trying to think, you know, of obviously some more specific examples of where it's worked out, but I, I just don't. It's forever changed my hunting strategy for sure. And and so during the rut, yeah, like just just moving to where the deer are, and I think it gives you a good option for being able to just bust right into bedding areas, doe bedding areas, without feeling like, well, you know, I'm going in here to hang a stand just before the season starts, and I might blow these deer out of here. Like, no, just just watch where the does are bedding during early season, and then adjust and throw a stand up in the middle of that during the rut, and you're going to be right where you need to be. I like that point, and I think, you know, we're talking about all the benefits of a mobile hunting strategy, but let's just for a second talk about the disadvantages of, you know, hunting semi-permanent stuff. I mean, deer pattern us so well, and, uh, you know, from year to year, and then also on a, you know, within the year basis, I guess you could say. Um, and I think we both have, we both could attest to the great success or the higher success rate we seem to experience when, you know, we're in a stand for the first time. But hunting, uh, you know, a stand that you've, maybe it's a box stand or whatever it is, that you've had up for a couple years, you're just, you know, again, it's the insanity thing. You're, you're just hoping something goes different than it has in the past with the exact same thing, except it's a vicious cycle because the more you hunt it, the more the deer know that you're hunting it. And so the more you hunt it, the less chance of them, you know, a good deer slipping up or really happens is the opposite of what a lot of people think. A lot of people think, oh, if I just put in my time in the stand, you know, a deer will come out because on the trail camera, you know, in the past, there's been a buck in here every, you know, within every three or four days, it seems like a good deer walks past. Yeah, that sounds good uh, in theory, but the more you hunt it, you can pretty much expect the less deer to walk past it. And that's kind of the way I look at it. And that's why, man, you know, like, like I was talking about earlier, when I'm in a new spot that I've never been before, I am like 10 times more vigilant. I'm a lot more excited and I'm a lot more engaged in the hunt than if I'm just sitting at the same old spot because like deep down in my head, I'm already beat. I'm just like, yeah, I've sat here, you know, a hundred hours before and not had any luck. So why is today any different? Yeah, and that definitely kind of touches on something that I want to mention. <sighs> Having a mobile setup allows you, yeah, it's more work. Like, it is more work on the front end and on the back end of every single hunt. But it does give you the option, if you're the type of guy that's like, hey, I've got lots of time, or I could make lots of time to hunt, it gives you the option where you can simply just hunt long enough that you are going to run into something you know, obviously every single time that you sit one particular spot, you're decreasing your chances. But on the other side of that, if you can hunt a new spot every single time that you go and have a little bit of strategy with it, even, you know, just, just think a little bit about the wind and stuff like that. And you're not just hunting terrible spots all the time. Obviously the more you're in the woods, the more likely you are going to be able to run into success. And so this, this mobile strategy might be the option for the guy that says, Hey, I really like hunting. And I, have the ability to hunt a fair amount but i also don't want to feel like i'm just pressuring the heck out of deer in one spot so that's that and that's a that's a benefit for guys like you and me that when we have the time to hunt we want to be in the woods every second we get um granted there's periods where there's more time than not but it kind of stinks whenever you're you're having to think about, well, do I really want to sit this stand again? Cause I've been pressuring deer there or whatever the case is. Yeah. And it's kind of gotten to the point so much now where I've done this on the, on, in the past on private land, but, uh, for instance, you know, a couple of spots that I hunted last weekend and saw deer, I really have no desire to go back there because, I have so many other spots in mind that I want to hunt and well, for one point I'll learn, I learn a lot more widely by going to new spots because then I have a little experience there. But secondly, my confidence in going back to one of the spots, even though like 
for instance, last, I guess, Tuesday, whenever I passed that doe, I had eight different deer in bow range. Um, excuse me, seven different deer in bow range. Like that's a heck of a hunt. That's a heck of a hunt. And while, you know, it sounds so good to go back there and sit again, I bet I could about bet you money. If I went back there and sat that stand again, I would not have a deer in bow range. I'd be lucky to see a deer. And it's not because, you know, I trashed around the spot. It's just that that spot was so good because no one had been in there and the deer had absolutely no clue anything was happening. And so kind of getting back to the confidence and excitement. I mean, I would just, I would so much rather be in a new spot and be trying something new and have that excitement level and the thought that the deer have absolutely no clue. They have no reason to suspect that anything's going on. So they're going to be less vigilant. They're going to be less um, on edge and hopefully give me, you know, that added advantage I have a couple extra seconds before they realize, you know, something's up. Yep, absolutely. Now let me ask you this, because I'm curious if it's something that, and this is a gear related question, but I'm curious if this is something that you've thought about or I'm sure that you've heard about, but I'm just curious to see if this is something that you've ever, you've considered. So they've been around for a while. Um, uh, I know I, I read a book a while back by John Eberhart that was, had to have been written around the early two thousands that talked about, uh, different hunting stuff. But one of the things that he was a really big proponent of was tree saddles. And with some of the new companies that are coming out with different saddles now, that's, it's kind of a big, I don't want to say fat. Like I hate to say like fat or trend because I, I, I can't necessarily weigh in on their usefulness or, you know, them being useful or not useful. But I, I kind of want to get your thought. Like, have you, have you considered or looked into, saddles or anything like that using a tree saddle yeah so i i I too have seen the recent craze growing and you know i can see where people are coming from i can see the point um at first i thought that it would be you know they looked really inconvenient and uncomfortable and you know not easy to use i'm sure there's a learning curve just like anything else but i imagine and from what, what i've heard from a lot of people I think, you know, once you've used them for a while, you're very comfortable with them. It's probably like second nature. On the other hand, for myself, I don't see a great point. Um, I just, you know, okay, so you hunt from a tree saddle, you still have to pack in the climbing sticks because we're hunting on public land. You can't screw in stuff. So I'm still going to have the, you know, seven and a half, 10 pounds of climbing sticks. So what's that, you know, what's another... 12 or 14 pounds on top of it for a hang on. I mean, you know, the other night I hunted a mile and three quarters back in and really to me, the biggest drawback of that kind of hunting is just the time. Like it just takes a lot of, you know, that's a 30 minute walk there and a 30 minute walk out. I mean, that's an hour of my time and time is so precious, especially right now with how busy I am. Um, I don't see tree saddles fixing that. And, uh, so, yeah, I I think at this point, it's just, it's not that there's any, you know, I don't think there's any big loss you get from using a tree saddle, except from, you know, first couple times or several times you use it, not being comfortable with it. I just don't see a big reason to do it. Um, I, There's just, everyone talks about, you know, being so light and all that, but I mean, I don't know about you, but a, a 12 pound hang on, that's pretty light. And then sticks, that's pretty light. I mean, my, my climber altogether i think is 14 or 16 pounds i mean that's light so i you know i have some molly uh military surplus straps on both of my stands with a uh, molly waist belt and that puts the weight on my hips and a little bit on my back and i don't really i you know i'm i just don't really feel it that much so personally for me uh, at least at this point in my life it you know i don't really need to cut that weight um I I could see someday maybe doing it. Um, and I think the, I think the versatility probably is, is higher, like different trees you could hang in, crooked trees, limmy trees, all that kind of stuff. You could probably be a lot more, uh, mobile. Uh, You could be a a lot less picky with your trees. Um, but that's my thoughts on that. I'm curious. What do your, what do you think about them? Is it something that you would ever want to do? 
so it's something just because it's it's a curiosity like i was looking at but there's a couple things that uh, i'm kind of less less attracted to with them and the first thing is obviously the cost like the whole the whole setup for most of those systems i mean the saddle themselves is 200 or so dollars and then you know you've got some ropes and stuff and then on top of that you've got the you have to have and this is the thing that i didn't really think about before that was the main turn off to me the fact that you have to have a platform anyway is yes, kind of the thing yeah. that completely at least for the time being like i'm interested in them and i would like to try one because Hearing some people talk about them, they're like way more, like some people talk like they're way more comfortable than sitting in a lock-on if you sit in a saddle. And so that mm -hmm. part of, and I could, I could definitely see that because you have that versus all the, all the tension being on like your butt and you can't really distribute it very well with the saddle. You can kind of distribute it throughout your, your legs. And so I can definitely see that, but at the same time, it's not it they can't be any quicker to set up because you have to strap something onto the tree anyway. I'm sure it is quieter and I'm sure it is lighter. I mean obviously those two things are a given. You have less metal and you have that's going to weigh less and be, you know, less to clang around. But at the same time, I mean, whenever I because I, I never really looked into them, but whenever I really started looking and I was like, well, you have to carry something to stand on anyway. That, that to me was kind of a, a turn off on the whole idea. And a lot of the time, you know, unless you have, they make some different products. Cause I, I started doing some research. I wasn't, I wasn't going to buy one, but I started doing research cause I was curious. And they make, I don't know. You've been buying out the whole oh, tree stand geez. section lately. <laughs> then, <laughs> That that'll be my last like tree stand purchases for a while there. Um, they make different, they make different designs of like either steps or platforms, and some of the t you know, and s some guys on private land or in areas where you can use screw in steps will just screw in a ring of like screw in steps around the top of the tree where they're going to be standing. And if you could do that, that would be one thing because then you could kind of walk around the steps. But I don't fully understand if you just have a platform how you spin around the tree to shoot the opposite direction. And maybe I don't maybe someone that has a saddle needs to tell me because I, I don't I don't fully understand that. Because I understand if you can walk around the tree with the saddle, like some people do, you know, if you have like a ring of steps around the tree, but if you're standing on a platform, I d I don't know. I don't fully understand how all that works. But the, I, I'm interested, but I need to it's kind of one of those things I would I would just need to hunt with one. I, I want to hunt with one, but I'm definitely not willing to pay to pay three hundred dollars just to try it out. Yeah, I agree. Um, it's interesting, and I and I can see where the comfort factor would be higher. Like I I really get that um, because it's almost like a Millennium tree stand seat where it's like a sling, mm -hmm. you know, because it's like it's cradling you, it's just holding you. Versus with all these tree stands, there's you know, most of them, at least there's a bar in a course that, that has a tendency to cut off the circulation to your legs, or it's at least really uncomfortable. So I get where people are coming from. It's just, you know, personally right now, I, I don't see a big reason for it for me. So I know there's some guys out there that absolutely love them. And someday down the road, that might be me. But today for now, I'm happy with the hang ons and climbers. Yep. Absolutely. And you know, I, while I'm happy I got my climber, and I, I definitely will use it, like, don't get me wrong on that, day in and day out, part of the reason that, that I decided to just go ahead and get the lone wolf is because unless I know for a fact there's a tree somewhere that I can get a climber into, that's what I'm going to be taking into the woods with me. Yeah. Yeah, and I think... I don't know. It It, it has everything to do with what kind of forest you're hunting in you know these bottomland hardwood forests i if i know i'm going to be in that i i like to have the climber because i can get up higher than i can with my three lone wolf sticks but if there's any kind of edge i don't you know i'll take the lone wolf <clears throat> and i mean 
this year, the three hunts that I've had deer in on me, I've had deer, or I've seen deer, I've had them, you know, within bow range. The first one was that morning sit. I was, my platform was six, maybe seven feet off the ground. They never saw me. The second one was the doe that I killed. I think I was maybe 14 feet off the ground and shot her, and then the other deer never saw me. And then the other night when I passed that doe and saw that two-year-old, I was in a climber, but I was still only, again, 14 or so feet off the ground, and I had deer all around me, never saw me. Well, that brings up a good point that you may be about to get to. No, I I wasn't, but, you know, yeah, it's the the deer aren't expecting you. Mm Mm-hmm. Because everybody's had a stand that they get pegged in, and I I don't have any off the top of my head that I just get pegged in like every time I sit there. Like, but you definitely see deer. I mean, walking through the woods in a hanging hunt situation, I I've never had deer just like, you know, casually glance up in my tree and then all of a sudden just peg me. Like they're typically just not looking for that. Whereas I've definitely had times where deer look up in the tree in permanent sets, and I don't think that they're like, oh, there's a tree stand in that tree, I'm going to look at it. But I'm sure it's just deer that I've busted out of a stand previously, and so they kind of have that knowledge that, hey, there was something in that tree one time, I'm going to be looking for that. And so I feel like you can get away with a lot more hunting a lot lower and just hunting in kind of wide open situations with hanging hunt versus just permanent sets because sooner or later with a permanent set, if you're getting busted all the time, deer are going to get used to that versus with a hanging hunt. Yeah. I mean, I'm not going to purposely hang wide out in the open as low as I can, but at the same time I feel more comfortable doing it because I, like I say, except for with scent, I never, I never got busted visually on a hanging hunt last year. I got winded a couple times, but never visually. Yeah. Actually, I take that back. I I take that back. I got busted on a hanging hunt visually one time. And that deer is on my wall next to me right now. So (laughs) I guess it still worked (laughs) out all right. And that's because he got about three yards from the base of the tree and saw my stick (laughs) and started looking around. (laughs) Well, I mean, that, yeah. That happened. That's. I guess that's going to happen. It's unavoidable for sure. I mean, it it can happen. So, but it, th- but that could. I mean, I don't. I don't. I'm not going to just use a climber from now on. Just oh, well, they're going to see my sticks. I mean, I've shot deer with about a ladder stands before, so I don't. I don't think that's that big of a deal. I, I just. I just realized that I'd forgotten one instance where I did actually get busted visually. Right. Well, you know, I guess one one more thing we should cover here, and that's. You know, for someone looking to go in blind to a spot, like we talked about the benefits of that, you know, kind of scouting, but what is, like, if it, I just want to lay out a scenario to you, and, and what would you do if you had a, a property, you were, you're approaching a property, you know, in the deep south, maybe down here, maybe it's a cypress bottom, a cypress swamp, or upland oak ridge, or, you know, that, that, um, lots of hardwoods, or maybe, um, Maybe it's a swampy bottom. What are you going to do, like, from a pre-hunt standpoint, I guess, with maps? And then how does that translate to, like, what you're going to do on the ground in trying to at least set yourself up? Because, I mean, it's not just enough to walk in the woods and find a good spot. Like, you have to be looking for it. So how are you going to set yourself up to find the hot spot uh, to eventually, you know, run a gun set up on? And what time of year is this? Let's just say, you know, any any time now till, you know, early rut. Oh, you couldn't give me an easy time and say, like, peak breeding, like deer running around with their heads cut off. <laughs> that's that's too easy. You just, like, go to bed and find <laughs> the thick stuff and sit down. It's not easy. <laughs> not that easy, but yeah, yeah, let's do now. So this time of year, a couple of the things I'm going to do, um, if if this area has a fair amount of pines and hardwoods mixed, one of the things I'm going to do is look at a map that was taken of a photo that was taken during the winter and find areas that are more hardwood dominated simply because that is where the hard and soft mast is going to be located. And then going forward, and obviously, you know, this is kind of assuming there's no like food plots that are a big draw or anything like that. So kind of throwing that out. 
Um, the thing I'm going to look for is either terrain or cover that's going to help deer bed better. And whether that means, you know, terrain as far as like ridges and hillsides and stuff like that to where they can bed on and be able to see and smell um, things. And, you know, again, I haven't personally proven it myself, so I'm not going to get too far down the line. But obviously there's a lot of theories on bedding and stuff like that. The deer tend to bed with the wind, on, at least in, ter- you know, country with some hills they tend to bed with the the wind coming over the top of the hill and then they're looking over the rest of the area and i'm certainly going to test that out this year and i have plans to hunt some spots but i can't really speak to that so i'm not going to comment on that too much but just looking for some terrain and or cover that deer are going to use to bed in and then i'm simply going to go in there and just start walking and i'm going to favor the interior of the area so I'm going to be trying to get to some middle point that's going to be as far away from the road as possible, just because that's typically where we're going to run into more deer. The other thing I am going to look at too, that I should mention is if there's water in there somewhere, be it a Creek or a swamp, obviously you know that I tend to favor hunting areas that are a little more swampy, but if, even if there's just a Creek there, that's an area that I'm going to look at because first off, in areas that are dominated by pines, the hardwood, the streamside management zones are typically going to be more hardwood based. So that's where your mast is going to be located. And then the other thing is with creeks is you have that additional opportunity for sign and you you have a funnel effect there. So, you know, not only is it funneling deer, you're also having an opportunity for areas that are easy crossings where there's going to be a bunch of sign laid down and yeah i mean i think that's that to me is the key points is just look for those areas that have either terrain or cover that are going to influence bedding and then try to find some sign that's kind of close to that and set up and i will say that with the mobile hunting setup i think you have to balance being conservative versus um aggressive i definitely think that there's something to be said about just getting as close as you can but at the same time it's not a bad idea always the first hunt to just back off a little bit and not be super aggressive and get too close. Now I do think if you just, I mean, you can't be, you can't be super passive with it because again, then you're never going to see deer, but there's something to be said about not just busting into the middle of everything first hunt and maybe setting back a little bit more of an observation set and trying to see what exactly deer are doing in that area. So I, I don't know. Those are, those are kind of the basics. I mean, it's very broad, um, but I don't know. Do you have do you have anything different that you would say with that situation? I would stress and it's pretty intuitive, but I would stress, you know, having ideas in mind and then approaching them with the wind um, you know, into the wind or at least with a crosswind so that you're not your scent is not blowing in the area where you're hoping um to find good sign to set up on. Um that's pretty pretty obvious. Uh, another thing I would add is you're talking about those kind of wet areas, swampy areas, openings along swamps, um, sometimes can have persimmons. So at least early in season, that might be a strategy is, uh, try to target those. Um, and then another thing that, and this comes to mind just simply because it's a strategy that there's a spot I'm thinking of that I, that I want to go check out, but basically a real large, um, young forested area it it was clear cut about 10 years ago um maybe actually a little less than 10 years ago but it's super thick still and so i'm I'm guessing there's a lot of deer bedding in there there's definitely trails coming out of it because i scouted it about two months ago but everything outside of it is hardwoods so in that situation i'm not re- really even gonna focus on the hardwoods just because there's so much um There's just so many options. Basically, what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk in. Whenever I can get a wind that's blowing out of that bedding or along the side of it, I'm going to just parallel it. And I'm probably going to walk about, I don't know, 80 to 100 yards from the edge of the bedding. Uh, Hopefully on a day where it's kind of breezy, so there's some movement in the woods and noise. And I'm going to look for a sign. I'm going to check out all the trails coming out of there. I'm going to look for, you know, dynamite trees. 
I'm guessing if deer are coming out of there, they're probably hitting the first tree available and eating there. And that's where they're going to be in daylight. Because if I could, I mean, I could set up a few hundred yards away, but if the deer don't get there in daylight, it does me no, no good. So I'm going to walk along that edge. I'm going to look for rubs, for tracks. I'm going to look for a good tree. And hopefully all that will come together at a spot. Uh, but even if I don't, you know, find all that, I'll probably just set up on whatever trail I find that have the most sign on it. Um, because I'm pretty confident I can get pretty close to the bedding there, but I, you know, in that situation, I'm not uh, confident enough in my ability to actually pinpoint where the deer are bedding in there because there's simply so much cover. So, you know, that's, that's one other situation. I mean, in a, in, you know, area where you have a, a really big young forest stand where there's been a clear cut, that's one thing you can do is just basically walk that edge and hope that the deer aren't bedded right on that edge. And yeah, I mean, that may happen. Um, but as they come out of there, they're probably not going to go super far in daylight. You know, they're going to hit that edge and hit the first mass tree and probably just park there until it's dark and work their way out from there. So that's really the only, only two other things I'd add. And, um, one other situation I can think of down here for anyone else in the deep South, uh, there's some property around here that has a lot of cypress on it. And I've noticed actually on Google Earth Pro going back in time at the aerial imagery, I can see where there's these oak islands out in the cypress. Just looking at the timing of, of leaf drop, I can tell that there's some oak islands. They're in the cypress bottom. The bottom is just really flat. It's not really um, a swamp. It can hold water, but there's these little spots. And I've walked a couple of those and they are covered up in deer sun and on those little oak islands because they're just, they're basically a huge forest of cypress, but there's no hard mass except in those little oak islands. So that's another thing I would say to look out for. And, you know, using that, using your scouting skills, your cyber scouting skills, you can kind of look back at the aerial imagery and see where these little pockets of hardwoods are or uh, oaks rather. And, that that's definitely a spot I would approach on the downwind side and even glass it a little bit, you know, coming up with binoculars so that I hopefully don't run right up on something. Um, if it's dynamite, I can set it right on the downwind edge and not spoil it. Yep. I a hundred percent agree. And it'll, it, it's frustrating whenever you do bust deer out of a spot that you're wanting to go hanging hunt especially a spot like that where it's not terribly likely that there's just going to be a bunch more deer past the ones that you bumped or something like that but at the same time that's why you get a lot of spots and always have your backup spots and just go in try to go in early enough to where you have time to maneuver around and hit up a backup spot if you do bust deer out but yeah, I think that's one of the things just just having the mindset and willingness and it's it's one of the fun things I look forward to I didn't get to scout the national forest that's close to town as often as I would like to have this past year. And while I've got, I've got like four or five spots on there, I definitely plan on some days, you know, just the 20 minutes or so before I leave to go hunt, just getting on Onyx and looking around and finding something that looks good and going in after it. Well, we'll be looking for those stories. I... I'm excited for tomorrow, and I'm not even going to be able to sit in a tree stand. I have a lab I have to go go to and stuff I have to, you know, school, but I'm excited. I hope to hear good stories and hopefully get a photo from me at some point. So, you know, of, of a nice. bloody arrow, not not just a dirty arrow or a miss. Or a, <laughs> it's got to be blood on it. Yep. Well, we'll, uh, we'll give it the best shot we can, and hopefully... Hopefully it'll end well. Like I say, I mean, if even if it was just seeing a seeing a two year old coming out of that bed or coming out of one of those whatever spot I end up deciding to sit, but uh, I'm looking forward to it, man. It should be fun. It's gonna be it's gonna be nice. There's uh, I was thinking about it last night, or I woke up this morning and I thought about it. I was like, you know, this is the last morning I have to wake up where it's like obviously you're not able to hunt every day of the season, but it's just different to be able yeah. to have the opportunity to think I could be in a tree today if I wanted to, or if I was able to, you know, like it, it, it it's just kind of cool. <laughs> so I agree. I'm pumped. Like about even it. though, th like even though this week I haven't been able to hunt, it's kind of like, 
a good feeling knowing deer season's open. <laughs> it's as stupid as that sounds. Absolutely. It gives you something to look forward to at least. Yeah. For sure. Well, I'm looking forward to hearing your stories next week and hopefully maybe I'll have one or two as well because I think I'll be able to hunt uh, this coming weekend at least a day or two. So with that being said, anything else to add until next time? I think that's it. All right. Well, we're expecting big things, Mark. So, you know, don't let us down. Well, don't be. (laughs) Keep your expectations (laughs) low so that I can (laughs) surprise you. With some good stuff. <laughs> I'm probably not even going to see any deer when I go. So there you go. Um, <laughs> anyway. All right. Well, everybody, thanks for sticking. If, if anyone has stuck with us to the end, thank you. Because um, we have rambled from everything from coolers to tree stands to hunting to work to whatever I can possibly think of. We've ranted, but... We appreciate you listening. We'll see you back here next week. Um, If you get a chance, check out the website, huntingtheland.com. Lots of content over there. Both, you know, other podcasts as well as lots of blog articles. Got some up there on habitat management recently. A little bit on hunting. Um, There'll probably be some more hunting stuff related in the the near future. And uh, with that being said... We'll see y'all back here next week, and thank you for listening.